Good evening, everyone. Well, today we kick off an eight-day Purdue Silicon Summit, and in the span of next eight days, there will be eight events, conferences, announcements, and celebrations, demonstrating yet again that Purdue is America's leading university in semiconductors, the foundation of national economic and job security. However, we also work with many other wonderful neighbors. We are leading together. So before I start the evening of this presidential lecture, I want to acknowledge our dear colleagues, partners, and neighbors from Illinois. Do we have UIUC? Rashid, welcome back. Uh, what a maker right there. I know, I know you work for UIUC now, but yes, always a boiler maker. Well, uh, uh, represented from uh, University of Michigan. Wonderful, thank you, Brad. Thank you for joining us. You've got a great football team and a great university. <laughs> and, and the Ohio State, ah, Ohio State. Uh, yes, the Ohio State. Do we have representative? Thank you, thank you, Dorita, and you are all your colleagues. We're all part of the Midwest. We're all part of the Silicon Heartland is just Purdue happened to be geographically the heart of the Silicon <laughs> Heartland. All right, that's enough bragging tonight. Well, I'm here to introduce on stage to all of you this evening uh, an amazing individual. Yes, he's the CEO of Intel, but it's a lot more interesting than that. Uh, at age 18, he started working for Intel as a technician with an associate degree without yet a bachelor degree, and he worked his way and learn at the same time to receive his bachelor degree, and then uh, became a principal designer of the 486 uh, chipset. And he was uh, rewarded by becoming the youngest vice president in Intel history at the age of 32, and this is back in the early 90s. And then he was promoted to be the first chief technology officer for Intel Corporation in 2001 and started eight years of amazing Intel innovation, in particular in Wi-Fi, USB, and multiprocessor. And then he became the CEO of EMC and then CEO of VMware for nine years. And then in February 2021, he was brought back to Intel. Welcome to the Boilermaker stage, Pat Gausinger, Intel CEO. Well, Pat, this is the uh, fireside chat without a fireplace. Uh, and, and I said this not lightly, that you're truly a leader and a person I admire. Thank you, Mom. Your intelligence, your integrity, your patriotism. Uh, why don't we start this fireside by asking you where this all started. You were born in a rural community. Mm -hmm. uh, was it Berks County, Pennsylvania? Yep, yep, uh, Small it. population. Uh, we have a lot of rural mm -hmm. counties right here in Indiana. We love all of the wonderful neighbors there, want to work together with them. Uh, so how did you end up being a technician at Intel at age 18 uh, with an associate degree? Yeah, and uh, I joke that when you get to nowhere in Pennsylvania, we were five more miles. Ah. Right, you know, and it's very, yeah, very rural between Reading and Hershey. You go out in the country, and that's where we were. Both of my parents were uh, educated in one-room uh, schoolhouses, first through eighth grade. Mm -hmm. You know, neither of them even has a high school degree, right? Uh, and my mom, my dad passed away about two years ago. My mom lives in the one-room schoolhouse that my dad was educated in. Hmm. today. They bought the, the school, right, and as I was growing up, right, you know, they didn't want us to be farmers, right, and go to school, get your PhD. I don't think mom and dad even knew what a PhD was, <laughs> right, uh, at the time, but it just drilled into us to go to school. Mm -hmm. I accidentally took a scholarship exam when I was, uh, you know, starting my junior year in high school, mm -hmm. and I won. Mm -hmm. And they said, you take the exam, you take the scholarship, or you lose it. 
Hmm. So I ended up skipping my last year and a half of high school. So literally hmm. at 18 years old, I finished my two-year degree hmm. uh, from uh, Lincoln Technical hmm. Institute. I had gone to community college and so on. And uh, Ron Smith came recruiting to Intel, mm. and uh, he was a uh, you know a, a senior leader at the company. He lived close to my parents, and uh, I was number twelve on the interview list for technicians to come and interview on the West Coast at Intel. And he you know at the end of the day he writes down you know smart, aggressive, arrogant. He'll fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> and I got invited to come to California. Uh -huh. I'm an eighteen year old kid. I've never <laughs> been on an airplane. Yeah, I'm going. <laughs> but mom. You know, they're crazy out there in California. I'm not leaving the, you know, Pennsylvania. And sure enough, they offered me a job that I could work and go to school. So I, you know, accepted the job, moved to California and started working on my bachelor's and then, you know, graduate work, uh, you know, Santa Clara and then Stanford for graduate work. I almost considered being a boilermaker, but, you know, you know I decided to stay in California at Stanford and, uh, you know, began an It's not too late, by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> offer online degrees. Uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Gotta, yeah. In semiconductors, even. <laughs> <laughs> but that began an incredible journey, right? Yes. And, uh, you know, here, here I am, you know, 43 uh, years later, yes. and it's like, does it get any, does the American story get any better than this? It is A an farm American kid story. from Pennsylvania, right, becoming the CEO of what I would argue is the most important company, not just in technology, mm -hmm. but in the entire American industry today. It is that important what we are doing. I want to come back to that, but absolutely, this is a truly inspiring story and reminds me a lot of Purdue's DNA. You know, we are a public land-grant institution serving all population. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful co-op program, Learning While Working. We work with Ivy Tech, which mm -hmm. is statewide and the U.S. largest single community college system. Uh, Sue Ausberman, who is, uh, she's the president and the boilermaker, uh, we work together, including on semiconductors, and we expanded the number of seats at the university while holding tuition frozen because we believe public education should be opening mm -hmm. the doors to all the boys and girls just like you uh, years ago. And we say excellence at scale. Yes, excellence, bragging one more time, say engineering mm -hmm. college, grad ranking, top four in America, uh, <coughs> but also uh, scale. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to workforce, certainly scale matters. When it comes to land grant spirit, scale matters. Uh, but let's talk about your mentors. I heard your first boss was actually a boilermaker, uh, yep. and he almost converted you. Uh, <laughs> and you also worked with the legendary Andy Grove. So what's the mentorship you received from them? Yeah, and uh, you know, Dave Brown was my first boss. He recruited me out. He told my mom, I'll take care of him when I came to California. You know, he brought me to visit Purdue here a couple of times when I worked for him. Uh, but uh, Andy Grove, I was uh, uh, working on finishing the 8386. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just, you know, when I was in charge of assembling the database yes. and bringing it together, you know, super intense period, yes. you know, working 20 hours a day, you know, just getting the yes. chip out. And I had to give an update to the leadership team of Intel. And these were literally the gods of the industry at the time. You know, Robert Noyce, the inventor of the integrated circuit, Gordon Moore, Moore's Law, and Andy Grove. And, uh, you know, I gave this up there, and essentially I chewed them out. Right, you know, I said, you know, my computers aren't stable. You know, I'm a precocious brat, 23 year old kid, 22 year old kid, you know, yelling at the, you know, veritable the yeah, of, the, of the industry. And a couple of days later, my phone rings, right? Pick, this is when the phones rang, yes, right? You know, yes. I picked it up, uh -huh. right? And it's, uh, it's connected who, to the wall, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Who is it? The voice comes back, Andy. Andy, who? Right? I was busy, right? He says, Andy Grove. <laughs> Right? Okay. And right, he starts shelling me with questions. Yes. Right, he says, "What do you read? What are you studying? What are your career objectives? What's your next job?" And I'll, you know, I am just so beside myself. I'm barely able to form a sentence, much less give him a coherent answer. Mm -hmm. and he says, "Lousy answers. Be in my office in a week with better mm -hmm. ones." Mm -hmm. Right? The president mm -hmm. tells you to show up in his office. What do you do? You either leave the country or you show <laughs> up. Right? So I showed up in his office, and that began a mentoring relationship with Andy Grove that lasted for 35 years. Wow. And mentoring with Andy was like going to the dentist and not getting Novocaine. Wow. He was hard, he was wow. tough, he was challenging, 
but he made you better, mm -hmm. right? And I mentored with him literally, you know, up until a few months before he passed away, mm -hmm. 35 plus years, and he complimented me four times in 35 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, he was a really nice guy. Uh, and those, you know, I have them all written down, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you, know you know, certified, notarized, right. et cetera, yes, right? Yeah, once in a decade, yeah. Hannah on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty bad, right? Uh, but uh, he made me better. And I would just say, every one of you, right, if you want to be everything that God enabled you to be, you need those kind of influences in your life, people that are making you better. And Andy made me better. That's an amazing story. And I read his book on the paranoid survives. Yeah. Uh, and uh, because of that uh, banner slogan, I work very hard these days, 20 hours every week. Uh, so uh, just like you did. Uh, well, no, you were talking about day. All right, fine, uh, more or less. Uh, well, um, let's talk about this iconic American innovation company called Intel. Right? And you spent 30 years in Intel, uh, and then you were brought back to turn it around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, well, God willing, let Intel be turned around. So, A, why do you think Intel, not because you're biased as the CEO, is the most important tech company or the most important company, period, in America? And B, how's the turning around going? Yeah, well, on the first part of it, you know, Meng, what portion of your life is not becoming more digital? Okay, what portion of your life is not becoming more digital? Everything is becoming digital, right? Mm -hmm. You know, every light switch, you know, every thermostat, you know, the phone in your pocket, the clouds that you connect to, you yes. know, everyone and everything's connected, yes. AI and you know, someone like this. Everything digital yes. runs on semiconductors, right? You know, we were, you know, sitting here, right, all sort of comfortably watching all of manufacturing get hollowed out into Asia, you know, and then COVID happened and we realized, oh my, right? We used to be the West, Europe and US used to manufacture 80% of all mm -hmm. semiconductors in the world. Mm -hmm. Today that's 20% mm -hmm. right, and declining. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we realized, wow, mm -hmm. this is really important. You know, I have entire auto manufacturing plants that are stopped, right? You know, $30,000 cars, entire manufacturing, yes. right? That are stopped because of a $1 semiconductor. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're all manufactured in Asia. We had we had that right here in Indiana yeah, yeah. with the many of our well, automakers. What happened? How did you know? And as I say, you know, there was never a vote in Congress to get rid of this terrible industry, but there <laughs> were strong votes in Taiwan, mm -hmm. Korea, China, Japan to take this industry. And over 30 years of industrial policy, and I'll say short-termism in the United States, hey, we just want high profit, you know, we don't want manufacturing, we don't want to make major long-term capital investments, you know, these are hard, big things, we don't want manufacturing low-wage jobs, right? You know, we just want, you know, high value, high margin, short-term, 90-day shot clock companies. And after 30 years, guess what? Mm -hmm. The industry's all in Asia. And it's mm -hmm. not just that the fabs are in Asia, all of the supply chains are mm -hmm. in Asia. You know, and COVID was this dramatic wake-up call, I think, for the planet to say, how did we let that occur? And as I like to say, for five decades, oil reserves mm -hmm. define geopolitics. Mm -hmm. I will argue that technology supply chains are more important for the next five decades. Mm -hmm. Let's build them where we want them. Mm -hmm. You know, and that has begun this, you know, passionate journey on my part to rebuild manufacturing in, a, in America, rebuild, right? The Rust Belt is mm -hmm. dead. Let the Silicon Heartland begin, mm -hmm. you know, right here in the Midwest. You know, the whole chip, that's worth of applause. Don't you agree? No. Yeah, come on. Yeah. This is a tough crowd, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'll say, I'll say. This is your heartland. It's almost like right? any growth. Right? Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, and it really is about rebuilding, not just the industry, mm. but rebuilding this iconic company, yes. uh, Intel. And, you know, obviously a lot of, you know, things that happened, you know, that, uh, you know, put Intel on a bad path uh, itself, bad strategic choices, bad execution. You know, I would say, you know, speaking to another engineer, non-technology mm. leadership of technology companies, mm. but all of that, you know, left Intel in a very weak state, mm. right? And so two and a half years ago, you know, I was asked to come back and lead the company. You know, the company I had dreamed of being the CEO of, mm -hmm. you know, the company I was pushed out of, you know, 13 years ago, and now the company that the vision I had uh, mm. three decades ago, I have the chance to rebuild the iconic Intel. 
in honor of the Trinity, as I call it, mm -hmm. Grove, Noyce, and Moore, mm -hmm. the people that created the Silicon Valley, you know, mm -hmm. that put silicon into the industry, you know, to rebuild its position in the technology industry, but most importantly, to rebuild Western manufacturing. And that's the job I came back to do mm -hmm. in leading this company. Yes. <laughs> Much better now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're getting it, they're getting uh, they're, they're, it. Yeah, yeah. Getting warmed up. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to echo what you just said, Pat, uh, on A and B part, right? On A part, again, I'm just bragging one more time that it was a boilermaker, John Atala, who was mm -hmm. the co-inventor of MOSFET, 1959. Mm -hmm. So he had his PhD from Purdue in the early 50s, and then he worked at Bell Labs. So MOSFET, of course, yeah, You're really gonna to try to convince me that every aspect of semiconductor started here. The 98% the, the of it. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so most, I, I was, to, I'm, I used to be a real engineer, I'm not a real uh, engineer anymore, but I was told by my colleagues that uh, the vast, vast majority, like 99% of the commercially produced uh, semiconductor chips are MOSFET type. Uh, so it's estimated 10 to the power of 22 which is a pretty big number, the largest quantity of human-made artifacts ever. Uh, so just rooting that back to, to Purdue one more time. But on the B part there, well, this complex supply chain, right, from mm -hmm. gas and material to tools and then design and the making and then the packaging, the whole supply chain there, right, to reshore that. And Intel has made some pretty bold, big, Bets, for example, a new business model, Foundry, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with MediaTek as one of the customers, uh, and a new set of technology goals, and then, of course, new capital investments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, how's uh, the reaction you're getting from the market as a public company CEO? Yeah, and you know, when we, you know, in the five years before I became CEO, Intel gave $70 billion to shareholders in buybacks and dividends mm -hmm. and invested $50 billion in capital. Mm -hmm. The strategy I have laid out is we're going to invest over $150 billion in capital mm -hmm. and give $20 billion back to shareholders. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that is a dramatic... Mm -hmm. right? You know, Who started that, of course? <laughs> right, you know, it's just a dramatically different strategy yes. to put the company on. This is a big, expensive capital industry. And it takes me five years to build the new factory. Yes. Right? That means near term, yes. right, you know, 90 day shot clocks versus five year capital mm -hmm. investments. Wow, you know, I've taken the company free cash flow negative. Right, for multiple years in a row, mm -hmm. taking as much leverage and debt that we possibly can, finding new creative mm -hmm. ways to go do this, mm -hmm. doing things like the Investment Tax Credit and the Chips and Science Act, mm -hmm. you know, to give us enough capital firepower you know, to go do that, to create this new foundry business model, to rebuild the technology leadership. And I said, you know, we're, you know it typically takes uh, five, uh, two years to do a major new node. Mm -hmm. I said, we're gonna do five years five nodes in four years, mm -hmm. right? That is like double time plus, right, you know, of the execution to get back to the best transistors on the planet being designed, invented, and manufactured right here. That's the course I put the company on. I said it takes five years to get that done, mm -hmm. right? And we're two and a half years into that journey. Mm -hmm. Wall Street didn't like that, right? And that is absolutely the right thing to do to accomplish that mission reestablish leadership, reestablish technology industry, reestablish uh, manufacturing. And you know, two and a half years in, they're starting to think we might pull it off, mm -hmm. right? And we're getting a little bit of positive movement mm -hmm. from the markets, you know, but the first two and a half years were not mm -hmm. fun, Mung, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you know, as I like to say, in Wall Street terms, the line between bold and crazy is mm -hmm. a thin one. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, they're not sure which side I'm on. <laughs> well, I want to come back to that uh, at the end. But you mentioned Chips and Science Act. Uh, so when I was working in the State Department, already started working on what was back then called the Endless Frontiers Act. Yeah. And yeah. then it morphed into a couple of different versions. And Indiana's uh, senior Senator Todd Young, uh, along huge, with Schumer, huge, yes. bipartisan sponsor in the Senate uh, of the Chips and Science Act. Uh, now. I asked this question also when Purdue hosted six months ago our last summit, which was now eight day long, only one day on Capitol Hill 
And the fireside I had was with Senator Young and Secretary Gina Raimondo, who mm -hmm. visited Purdue a little over a year ago as well. And I asked this question. Uh, a lot of people are wondering, yes, semiconductor industry is very, very challenging when it comes to scale and speed. So they sort of get that you need a catalyst. And this chips, part of the chips and science, is that catalyst. But people can't help but wonder, is this industrial policy in a fast-moving tech industry? So what's your thinking on how to execute CHIPS Act? Yeah, you know, and the way, you, when you think about it, you know, I have these five plus year capital investment cycles, right? And China, Taiwan, Korea, Japan have made 30 plus years of industrial policy decisions, mm -hmm. right? You know, that they have done to go establish this industry. And, you know, read Chip War, you know, the Chris Miller book, right? You know, he chronalizes this. This is industrial policy. Mm -hmm. And if this is an industry that's important to the American future, it requires industrial policy because near termism in Wall Street is not getting us the right answer. You know, I was speaking to one of the EU uh, regulators one time, and he said, we should only get involved where there is proof of market failure. Mm -hmm. And I looked at uh, uh, Secre uh, 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 Commissioner Vestager uh, at the time, and I says, well, Europe went from 42% of this industry to less than eight, and you're declining. If that's not market failure, mm -hmm. tell me what is, right? And to me, it's that gravity. This requires industrial policy, and that's why I was so proud you know, mm -hmm. to be on the White House lawn for the signing mm -hmm. of the CHIPS Act. Why I was so proud you know, to do a whole lot of shoe leather on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill to get this pushed across, and why you all should be very proud mm -hmm. of uh, Senator Young's role in pushing this across. Because the idea of industrial policy, it's almost become a dirty word, mm -hmm. right? But all, you know, we don't think, I gather you don't think it as I, a dirty word. I, I think it's, it's an essential word, right, if we are going to be competing for leadership in systemically critical industries, right, 80 to 20. And it's not going to come back because we want it to. We need policy decisions to accomplish that. And since the Chips and Science Act was signed into law, you know, we've had five major semiconductor manufacturing projects initiated. You know, Intel's two, mm -hmm. you know, TSMC, Samsung, and mm -hmm. Micron. Mm -hmm. It is having that catalytic effect mm -hmm. that you described. And you know, chips, you know, we have four proposals in front of Chip's office now, mm -hmm. Oregon, Arizona, New Mexico, and Ohio. Right, you know, we're looking for that funding. We're working with Treasury on how mm -hmm. you know the investment tax credit works. Mm -hmm. You know, we need policies that say yes, we want these industries, and yes, we're willing to invest in them. And our economic, you know, national security and our tax policies will reinforce these are industries that we want here because they create mm -hmm. every strata of the economic tier. Mm -hmm. Right, they create leadership technologies that we care about for the long term, and they assure our national security for decades to come. Yeah, I'm passionate about this. No. Well, yeah, tell me what you really think. Right? Uh, well, to those of uh, you in the audience, uh, not sure how much are we talking about and how are they decomposed. So the pie chart is sort of like there's 39 billion uh, of subsidy along with additional tax credits in the CHIPS Act uh, for industry. And then there's about $12 billion for R&D type. Research, science, right. right. Two out of the 12 billion were allocated roughly to Department of Defense, which rolled out the first major tranche of CHIPS decision of mm -hmm. any slice, and that happened right before the federal fiscal year ended uh, last month. Uh, and Purdue being the lead university in Indiana with the Indiana-led Midwest consortium, including mm -hmm. Illinois and Michigan, yep. uh, one of the eight hubs selected out of 80 plus proposals. Uh, now, Purdue has been for the past 18 months intentionally and intensively working on all four corners, workforce, and research innovation and industry collaboration, including economic development and job creation and policy influence at the national and like-minded global level. Uh, part of these eight days of the summit here would involve all four aspects. Now, one thing that people have been asking about is certainly, well, what kind of a role 
can a university play, right? Yeah. Uh, what's Intel's view on what kind of role can universities such as Purdue play? Yeah, and, and I think there's uh, you know, at least three different dimensions mm. that I'm looking for uh, universities to play as part of this. You know, clearly, this is a new workforce. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, and you know, what is the product of a university? Mm -hmm. Talent, students, you know, people I can hire. So clearly, workforce, you know, development is a key and unique role. You know, mm -hmm. second, of course, is the uh, research. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, I want pre-competitive research to assure the long-term leadership, you know, in uh, these domains. What are the next ideas? How do we make sure mm -hmm. Moore's law? I'm going to take care of Moore's law between now and 2030. Done. Mm. We got it taken mm -hmm. care of. But between 2030 and 2040, you got something. Purdue. Yeah, we yeah. got it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you, you got them all. Yeah. More or less. 98 uh, percent, I think, was the answer. Oh uh, yeah, well, okay. let's have Ohio State, <laughs> Michigan, <laughs> Illinois <laughs> together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is that coming from? From Michigan. Uh, so, but the third piece. You've got two the more. Third yes. Piece oh, of one this. more. Right, you know, so I mean, workforce development, long-term, mm -hmm. you know, pre-competitive uh, research leader, you know, but there is a political agenda here as well, mm. right? And, you know, I mean, that has to happen at the state level, has mm -hmm. to happen at the national level. You know, we, uh, you know, the uh, CHIPS was funded, science wasn't mm -hmm. funded. It was the CHIPS and Science Act. We still have a lot of political work to get done mm -hmm. here as we stand up, you know, the long-term infrastructure requirements, mm -hmm. the funding support. We've seen government funding for long-term research decline, you know, over multiple uh, decades, mm -hmm. right? R's mm -hmm. and D's in administration as well. So we have to rebuild our long-term science capacity in the nation, you know, and I think yes. that's the third task in front of us. And the last point on this, you know, that I just would like to add here, I am thrilled right, to see Michigan, Ohio State, Illinois here today, because to me, this is the Silicon Heartland, mm -hmm. right? And the collective capabilities, if you all come together, right, and really bring those capabilities, no one of you by yourself can pull this off. It is way mm -hmm. too capital intensive, you know, way too uh, challenging, but together, I have great confidence yes. in the Silicon Heartland of the future, you know, so thank you. Yes. Although, Pat, I have to add only one of those four universities in the heartland uh, won both uh, men's basketball, Big, Chan, Big Ten championship, and Big Ten tournament uh, in 2023. Yeah, uh, okay, anyway. You anyway. can guess. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, uh, so, <laughs> speaking of research, um, now, again, Purdue is proud to have 30 plus outstanding faculty members ranging from uh, design and systems and applications and software to tools to devices to packaging and heterogeneous integration. Uh, one thing I've heard is people are looking at the CHIPS Act and say, yes, I hear a lot about workforce. Great, mm -hmm. semiconductor degrees program at Purdue, wonderful. But is there a sort of a technological moonshot goal? Mm -hmm. Maybe Moore's Law to 2050, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. you cannot split atoms easily at scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, and affordable way, not yet. So is it advanced packaging, 3D integration, heterogeneous integration? That's where you're gonna sustain the Moore's Law to 2050 in an economically viable way. So is there a technological rallying cry in your mind? Yeah, well what, one, right, you know, I'll just say, you know, from an economic view, right, before we get to the technology view, right, you know, we went from 80 to 20. You know, my objective in a decade, we go from 20 to 50. Right, because that is such a dramatic change in the vector of the industry, you know, that we say, that's right, we have reshored, right, you know, manufacturing in the supply chains coming with it. We truly have created a geographically balanced and resilient supply chain, Asia, mm -hmm. Americas, uh, and Europe. And to me, that is a moonshot that requires an extraordinary amount of work. Right, and if you know President van der Leyen from Europe was here, you know Secretary Raimondo was here, right? They agree. You know, 50% mm -hmm. in a decade—that's a moonshot and requires mm -hmm. all of our work to go make that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to me, that's part of the objective. You know, second would be, you know, we do see our our way clear for a decade of Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. Right, the advancements in lithography, the advancements in transistor structure, power delivery, and advanced packaging. 
right? And this is sort of the new lever of Moore's law. Today, we put about 100 billion on our most advanced chip. You know, here's my 486 chip. You know, you give me credit for my yes. lapel. You know, 1985, one, 86? Yeah, uh, 89. 89. 89. Yeah. And it was 1.2 million transistors. Yes. Our most advanced chip today is about 100 billion transistors on a package. And we see our way clear to a trillion transistors about 2030. A trillion transistors. You know, and, and, and just, you know, when you think about visiting one of our, mm -hmm. you know, factories, mm -hmm. these are the largest construction projects on earth. Mm -hmm. You know, concrete and chemicals and, you know, power yes. delivery and yes. so on, building the smallest things that have ever been built yes. on earth. The biggest to produce the smallest. Yes. I mean, it really is spectacular. Yes. But then the technological, mm -hmm. right, you know, breakthroughs are so numerous that mm -hmm. are from 2030 to 2050. One of the things I say is one of, you know, my stump speech, you know, rallying mm -hmm. cries, until the periodic table is exhausted, mm -hmm. Moore's law is not done, uh -huh. right? And, you know, we're, we use about I a I really third. like that nerdy visualization. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, right, we use about a third of the periodic table today. So we still got two thirds to go among. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of particles left yet. We haven't no. mined their full chemistry and science. No. You know, we also, you know, we see, you know, that we have a huge climate problem in two dimensions, mm -hmm. right? You know, one is the energy consumption. Today, all of IT consumes four to five percent of the earth energy consumption, mm -hmm. right? You know, when you think about these big gen AI systems, et cetera, mm -hmm. you know, that's expected that that probably over a decade, five X's to 20 to 25 percent of the Earth's energy is being poured into IT systems, you know, so on. I think that's unacceptable. You know, we have to find breakthroughs and low power techniques that allow us to continue to have, you know, the biggest computers and generative AI built, right, without, you know, forcing us to have the next energy crisis. And most of those technologies must be done with renewability and climate mm -hmm. uh, in mind. You know, we also have new chemicals to find, but we also have chemical problems that we mm -hmm. haven't solved. You know, things like PFAS chemicals, you know, they're still required in, in uh, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So it's breakthroughs in packaging, it's breakthroughs in optics, it's mm -hmm. breakthroughs in low power technology, it's breakthroughs in advanced 3D packaging. Mm -hmm. You know, silicon used to be, you know, the Denard scaling at X and Y, now it's X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. right? As we're stacking silicon and getting, you know, 3D mm -hmm. silicon, uh, capabilities. And, you know, right, as exciting as AI is, mm -hmm. right, we should spend a second, right, on this as yes. well. You know, AI is now about 50 years old, mm -hmm. right? And when I was working on the 8046 in the uh, mid 80s, mm -hmm. I declared we're going to make the 46 a great AI chip mm -hmm. in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. What happened in the 80s in AI? Nothing. Mm -hmm. And then here we are, 30 years later, mm -hmm. the algorithms got good enough. Yes. The data got big enough, mm -hmm. the compute got powerful enough, yes. and all of a sudden. But we're still in the early innings, yes. right? You know, and the amount of innovation and research in front of us here, mm -hmm. and how are we going to build chips that allow us to truly bring AI everywhere, mm -hmm. right, you know, uh, into it. So, and that's going to be new physics, that's going to be new materials, you know, that's mm -hmm. going to be new architectures, new software as well. So, you know, hey, we got a whole lot of boilermakers to put to work here. No, well, uh, are you recruiting tonight, <laughs> Pat? Uh, I am always recruiting. Well, uh, uh, send Pat your CV. Uh, <laughs> now, I want to come back to AI from a different angle in just a minute, but to echo what you just said there, right? It is a tremendously, mind-bogglingly complex, both complexity in the supply chain and also complexity in the technological situation. As you said, the largest infrastructure building, the tiniest enablers of every other industry as the foundation of our digital future, while becoming obsolete within a decade, you mm -hmm. spend tens of billions, and then the cycle is moving so fast. So yeah. the yield, the, the economics, and then the scale and the speed of it. Uh, when I was at State Department, I had to explain to some of the colleagues, say why packaging of chips is foundational to economic security of our country. Uh, at the end of uh, a meeting, somebody pulled me over and said, uh, well, so Meng, uh, you know, I, I don't want to second guess what you said as an engineer, but are you serious that packaging chips into bags 
is the foundation of the digital <laughs> and the economic security. I said, no, not that packaging, not that chip. Yeah. Although I like that chips a lot too. Uh, now, this, this ability to move forward at this kind of scale and speed comes down to innovation. So one of my favorite classes is that innovation ultimately is what sustains the onshoring to the United States, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. One is high margin new products. One is reducing the dependence on cheap labor uh, supply with mm -hmm. innovation leading and ultimately innovation rewrite economic boundary conditions. Uh, now, on AI, there are so many interesting questions we can talk about. Uh, let me ask this question. Uh, do you think that the CEO's job, oh, well, let's say presidents of universities' job, yeah, can yeah, let's be, pick on you. Uh, yeah. that's a much better analogy, uh, can be just replaced by AI? Because frankly, you know, there are all these direct reports to the president, they do all the real work anyway, and then there are the deans and the heads, faculty, staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I often wonder, you know, if I'm just replaced by a chat box, chat bot for like a week, would anyone notice? <laughs> uh, probably wouldn't. So. Uh, let's talk about job displaced and new jobs created by AI, enabled by chips. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think are the jobs that's going to be quickly disappearing? What are the new jobs? Yeah, you know, and I, and, I, and I have a very optimist view of this, right, in the sense that, you know, I mean, do we, you know, did the, did the spreadsheet replace finance? You know, became a super powerful tool to make the mm -hmm. finance... Right, you know, and if you would go to have a tax person mm -hmm. do your taxes this year, mm -hmm. and they said to you, "Oh, you know, I don't use spreadsheets," right? Yeah, you know, right. You know, I'm just really confident I, I can do the math just mm -hmm. fine myself. Would you use them? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, today would you go to a radiologist that doesn't use AI assistance mm -hmm. in reading? You know, radiology mm -hmm. today proven to be you know uh, a radiologist assisted mm -hmm. by AI. Right, you know, is you know uh, almost a hundred percent more accurate. Yep. Right at that point, would you go to that radiologist in the future to read your? Right, mm -hmm. of course not. Mm -hmm. Right, and to me, you know, AI is like this powerful tool that we're just starting to unlock. You know, and would you not use it in those domains? Right, you know, hey, so I'm going to eliminate paralegal work. You know, if we pick mm -hmm. on the attorneys for a second. Why? Because my AI That's a popular is, target. Yes, yeah, let's yeah, do they're that. they're fun, yeah, right? Yes. You know, right, you know, and so on like that. But all of a sudden, attorneys get to be far more productive in new ways. So, yeah, we're going to destroy some jobs. You know, but generally, technology over cycle after cycle after cycle, for every job it destroys, it creates one and a half jobs, right, mm -hmm. over more, you know, studies over time. And if you're part of one of those that are displaced, that hurts and that's painful. Right, and we're seeing job, you know, and career duration shrink, mm -hmm. right? Even as you know, our life, you know, spans increase and our job durations are increasing. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our career lifespans are increasing as well. It simply means that you know, hey, I need a lot more educational, you know, mm -hmm. cycles in my career. You know, and ongoing training and learning associated with it. But AI is going to be destructive, right? It is a powerful source, mm -hmm. and it's going to enable new domains of productivity mm -hmm. that are unimaginable, mm -hmm. you know, today. So if you're a president, so now let's come back to your initial question. If you're mm -hmm. a president who doesn't use AI mm -hmm. tools and techniques uh, mm -hmm. in the future, you too will be like the finance guy who mm -hmm. chose not to use spreadsheets. You will get replaced, Mung. Okay, note to myself, all right. Right. I'm going to have to pivot a little bit starting tonight. <laughs> uh, why don't we pivot to the best part? Questions from students. Uh, so let's see, we've got a number of students who wanted to ask questions. Is Catherine here to pass the mic around? Thank you, please. Um, thank you so much, uh, President Chang and Mr. Gelsinger, for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Abigail Crossman, and I'm studying finance and data analytics at Purdue. Um, and I have a question for you from Priya Wakefield, who's also a business student. <clears throat> she asked, in a 2021 Washington Post interview, you discussed the limitations to power controllers and how widespread the major gap in supply had become as we move towards a more digital era at a rapid pace. Do you believe that we have bridged this gap in supply? And if not, do you have any suggestions as to how the industry can work effectively towards equilibrium? Yeah, and uh, you know, the semiconductor industry is a hideous industry in this respect because it has very long supply chains, 
You know, when we start a new product that takes us almost six months to get it done, right? We have these capital intensive, you know, factories, right? That if you run them empty, they cost X. If you run them full, they cost X. So you have to run them flat out 101% all the time to make them economic, right? And it takes you five years to build new capacity. Okay, so it's a terrible industry that way because you have to predict what the supply demand characteristics are five years into the future. You know, you can't even predict what the stock market's going to do tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? Or what the economic cycle is going to be. When does it, are we going to go into a recession? You know, what's the inflation rate going to be? Is the Fed going to rate, right? You can't even predict one week, one month, one mm -hmm. quarter kind of cycles. And I have to make five-year decisions, mm -hmm. right? COVID cost, you know, the, the semiconductor industry is growing four to five percent per year on average. COVID caused it to grow 20 plus percent right, as you went into COVID, and it disrupted the supply chains, that supply went down by minus five. Mm -hmm. So now you go from a fairly supply demand balance, four to 5% growth mm -hmm. cycle, to 20 plus percent demand and a minus 5% mm -hmm. to supply. Wow, what a disruption to an industry that can't change its trajectory less than five years at a time. Gordon Moore had this uh, funny saying, you know, he was said that semiconductors, you have supply demand balance exactly two moments in time. One moment on the way up, one moment on the way down, <laughs> right, for it. Now, you know, all of that said, you know, most of the acute supply demand balance issues are now mostly resolved again. So we're at that moment, right, where we've come down hard enough and far enough. That said, the semiconductor industry today is about a $600 billion industry. You know, most analysts uh, forecast that by the end of the decade, it's a $1 trillion industry. So I'm sitting here today, 600 billion. Am I gonna cap put the capital in the ground over the next four or five years, right, that allows me to have $400 billion of more market opportunity at the end of the decade? Or, since we're in a poor economic cycle, are we going to choose not to do that and listen to Wall Street with their 90-day shot clocks? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of decisions that we have to make. You know, welcome to my world, right? And what are we doing? We're building the factories for tomorrow, and one of them's right here in the Silicon Heartland. Thank you for that question. We have a few more students here, please. Thank you, Mr. Gelsinger. My name is Chloe Fanning, and I'm a sophomore in nuclear engineering. Our next question is from Kelly Leahy in the College of Engineering, and she asks, what has been the biggest struggle you've faced when pursuing innovation? You know, one of the challenges in pursuing innovation is, you know, one is you know, the difference between good and best is so hard to tell the difference, right? And you know, the best ideas, win, right? You know, good ideas, you know, become ones that get, you know, and so you're having to make these hard judgments around best, right? And the best idea done at the wrong time, okay, can still be a market failure mm -hmm. in that regard. So not only do you need to pick the best idea, right? You need to pick it at the right time and invest in it in the right way uh, over time to be successful. And the history shows most people get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, remember the success rate of startup companies is eight and nine die, one in nine leads a dreadful existence, and one, I, I mean, a one in 10 leads a dreadful existence, and one in 10 is highly successful, right? That's the best venture capitalists mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. one out of 10, yep. right? You know, at that result. So it's super hard, you know, to make these judgments. So how do you do it as good as you can? One is you get the best people that you possibly can, right? You have the best breadth that you possibly can, and that's university research. It's why visits like this are so important, right? You know, what's going on, right? You know, what's being researched? It's also being very connected to the venture community, right? So that you're, you know, which ones are hot, which ones are not, how are they evolving? And, you know, a lot of it is intuition and judgment at the end of the day, because you know, many you know, great ideas get overfunded too soon and they flame mm -hmm. out because you can't afford them. And then you know, many times, right, you hang on to things when you should have killed it, 
right, and move those resources forward. This is a very hard thing to manage uh, innovation. And now I'm 40 you know, plus years uh, in the technology industry uh, in a variety of roles, and I still get them wrong, but I am so excited because there is so much innovative work around us, mm -hmm. you know, that you get to work on a consistent basis with the best and the brightest and the craziest ideas and just envisioning how that idea might be the one that truly, right, mm -hmm. helps to shape the lives and touch the lives of more humans on the planet. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the magic of technology. Mm -hmm. Well, it is an art yeah. that tastes based on a diversity of viewpoints mm -hmm. and inputs and conflicts of ideas, and, uh, but in the end, it is yeah. an art. Uh, yeah. The difference between the good and the best yeah. at the right time. And I, as CEO, I have to make those decisions and make sure they get properly funded. Hey, you know, and I'll have lots of people saying, kill that one, that's wasting resources and so on. It's like, no, I'm not letting go of my dream. And then sometimes I gotta let go of my dream. Right. See, in my job is a whole lot easier. I simply ask ChatGPT, what should I do on this? <laughs> uh, well, uh, is there two, oh, maybe is there, there's one more at least, maybe a couple more questions from students. Thank you, President Chang and Mr. Gelsinger. This next question is from Kelly Lay, or Philippa Maria Rodriguez Pinzon from the School of Business. In one of your CEO's letters to shareholders, the four key superpowers, cloud, mobility fueled by 5G, AI, and machine learning, and the intelligent edge are mentioned. Your improvements to 5G and AI are evident with your focus on XPUs. How do you plan your innovation with the intelligent edge? Yeah, thank you. And you know, I've now added, from the time I wrote uh, that uh, particular letter to shareholders, I've added a Why fifth. would you read the letters to shareholders? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't you have enough homework? Uh, okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah. He asked ChatGPT <laughs> to, to read, read the it, I yeah. guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> give it. But you know, I've now added a fifth superpower. I call okay. these the technology superpowers. Everything computes, everything's connected. Uh, infrastructure at scale, cloud mm -hmm. and edge. Uh, AI, right, this ability to process and do it. But I've also added a fifth one since then. Mm. Sensing, mm. right, that our computers can now sense everything, right, and particularly with AI capabilities, we can see better. You know, when I put an autonomous vehicle on the road, you have two eyeballs and you get distracted. When I put an autonomous vehicle on the road, you know, we have 13 video lenses, two, you know, LIDARs and one radar, and they don't get distracted by your instant messaging, right? You know, when they see in multiple domains and multiple ways, you know, we see better, we know where we are, they don't get lost, we hear better. And, uh, you know, personally, you know, my family has a, you know, a history of hearing loss, you know. So here is my neural network enhanced mm -hmm. hearing aid, mm -hmm. right? You know, and sometimes, you know, hey, you know, when I get a text message from my wife, it's auto uh, converted mm -hmm. and I hear it, mm -hmm. right? You think I'm talking to you, Mung, I'm actually hearing love words from my wife, mm -hmm. uh, right? So uh, uh, anyway. Wow, that's even better. Uh, yeah, it certainly is. But these five superpowers, yes. you know, are, you know, I think, you know, have so much mm -hmm. yet in front of us. All right. You know, there's so many things we haven't computerized yet, so many things yet to be connected, you know, so much intelligence to be brought. You know, and AI is just proving to be this, uh, you know, incredibly aggressive cycle mm -hmm. of innovation uh, yet in front of us. You know, and, you know, in particular, as you think about the edge, right? And next time you go into your, your favorite fast food restaurant, I want you to jump over the counter and look at what computer is under the counter, okay? Mm -hmm. You might go to jail, but don't worry, mm -hmm. Mung will get you out, mm -hmm. right, you know, for it. You know, but now, right, you're starting to see, hey, we have cameras that are sensing when the food, right, hasn't mm -hmm. been changed more recently. You know, time to update the food, it may, you know, need to be, or refilled, or so mm -hmm. on, or supply chains being adjusted. You know, and this idea of, you know, I call it the three laws of edge computing, mm -hmm. right? Where one is the, the laws of, you know, uh, uh, physics, mm -hmm. right? You know, if I'm gonna process at the cloud, mm -hmm. right, it's 200 millisecond round trip to the cloud, right? The laws of physics, if I wanna do it in real time, it must be done at the edge. Right, second, right, your laws of economics, right? Mm -hmm. The edge, if I can process that data at the edge, right, it's much cheaper, much more cost effective. And third is laws of the land, 
right? You know, if I do it at the edge with provenance and control of data, right, I don't have data to privacy. I don't have worries of, you know, leakage of data. So I call it the three laws of edge computing. You know, and we believe that computing, connectivity, AI, you know, is going to allow us to truly build the intelligent edge. You know, in the last 20 years of computing has largely, you know, followed the model of cloud native computing, mm -hmm. right? Where people are building their applications for a cloud native environment. I believe the next 20 years will be edge native, where we will be building applications uniquely focused on a distributed, intelligent, AI-powered edge, and that will be the dominant form of application development. And you know, I think Intel is pretty well positioned to help enable that. Absolutely. First of all, I may have to uh, confiscate that uh, you know extra band out of band communication device. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is music to my ears. Personally, is yes. 15 years ago I started uh, uh, first university lab devoted to edge compute uh, at another institution, and over the years uh, a lot of uh, PhD students, postdocs working on edge compute. And back then, I remember people asking me, "This is 2008-ish, right?" Says, "Mom, have you heard of the word cloud? <laughs> edge is only going to get dumber and dumber." <laughs> and I say, "You know what? You know, somebody once said, if you are a 40 clock phase." and just stay where you are, gonna be correct twice a day. Yes. I'm gonna go stay uh -huh. at the edge and the pendulum brick, uh, click stick, you know, swinging, eventually I'm gonna be right. And uh, the three benefits you just mentioned, uh, this is uh, probably Physics, 14, 15 years yeah, ago, yeah. I had some conversation with your current colleagues at Intel as well, you know, and we came up with the acronym SCALE, and you know, S for security, uh, C for cognition, uh, a for agility of development mm -hmm. cycles, uh, L for latency, mm -hmm. uh, as in reduction of both uh, latency and jitter, the variation of latency, uh, and then uh, E for efficiency, as in D2D and D4D communications. Uh, so I still, on certain Saturday mornings, uh, do research. And uh, so uh, this can get carried away very quickly now, but let me bring back to the students. By the way, if you are taking my classes, uh, co-taught with Professor Chris Brinton, I'm gonna have a lecture on the edge compute, my favorite topic for 15 years coming okay. up. Uh, but before that. Maybe I'll attend? Uh, uh, well, you're gonna ask tough questions like okay. any grow, so <laughs> no. Uh, I won't give you the Zoom link. So, uh, do we have another question from students? Please. Our next question is from Dev Patel, a student in the College of Engineering, and they asked, how did going to VMware from your Intel position prepare you for your new role as the Intel CEO? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, when I left Intel, um, you know, I was pushed out of Intel, and it was devastating, because I had, you know, been operating for 20 plus years that that was my dream. Right, was to be the CEO of Intel. And when I was pushed out, you know, it took me years to get over it. You know, I was angry, I was upset. That was the job I wanted. You know, it was what I called the death of a vision, mm. right? And you know, when you have a dream, a vision, and it's killed in front of you, mm -hmm. that's hard. But then I began, you know, what I would say an 11 year journey of personal development, mm -hmm. new skills. You know, I became the CEO of a successful software company. Right, I'm the first ever CEO of Intel that was a CEO before taking on the job. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, I knew how to work with board of directors. I learned entirely new industries and systems mm -hmm. and software, and I learned entirely new cultures. Mm -hmm. I was humbled. Mm -hmm. Right, I lost mm -hmm. my you know vision right of what I wanted to be, and mm -hmm. you know Intel might have done better had I not left, but I would not have been better. Mm -hmm. And that journey of going away, mm -hmm. right? You know, Intel was neither good nor bad, it was. You know, I started at Intel so young, I went through puberty there, <laughs> right? You, you, you know, right, and I didn't know any other culture. Mm -hmm. Now I had new cultures to start saying, okay, what is good, what mm -hmm. is better, and how am I gonna shape this culture uh, mm -hmm. into the future? And that 11 years outside of the company made me a much better leader you know, for uh, Intel uh, today. And mm -hmm. I come back to it, not just as a better leader, you know, but far more committed to the vision, mm -hmm. you know, than I uh, would have been. And a set of skills that I could not have mm -hmm. had, right, when I was there. And, you know, for many of you, you're early in your careers, 
And you know, sometimes you're just gonna get the snot beat out of you, right? And it's gonna hurt. And you're gonna be pissed off. And my advice to you would be embrace that as the greatest learning experience you can possibly have. Because when you're successful, you don't grow. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, I was really good today, wasn't I? Yeah. <laughs> when you have, when you, your vision is killed, when you're, you know, in the, you know, toilet, you're just, you know, struggling and, you know, beaten up, that's when you're ready to grow. Mm -hmm. That's when you're ready to learn. That's when you're ready to change your character, to do the hard work, right, mm -hmm. of rebuilding yourself. And that's what happened to me in the 11 years I was out of the company, right? And, you know, those to me, you mm -hmm. know, you, you grow when you're most challenged and in your failures. And I just encourage each one of you, embrace those to get everything you can out of those learning experiences and come back a better mm -hmm. person as a result. And Pat, thank you for sharing that with us. And that reminds me of uh, and Steve Jobs' uh, journey. I don't know if there are uh, enough parallels or not, but uh, at least uh, in the sense that uh, he was forced out of the company mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. he co-founded and built. But then he did come back, and boy, that was a comeback. Yeah. So I sure hope Intel will do as great under your leadership as Apple did under Steve Jobs. Uh, well, one of the, uh, one of the uh, abuse of powers I enjoy is I get to ask the last couple of questions. Uh, so the second to last question I ask on behalf of our sister universities here in the middle of the country. Uh, we are proud. We say, look, mm -hmm. look at the, depending on what ranking you read, the top seven or eight engineering colleges, three of them are right here in driving distances, right? Uh, if you look at the large Big Ten universities, driving distance, draw a circle, you see many more other great universities yeah. here. Uh, we think we have a lot to offer in talent, in innovation, in that resilient spirit as well. Um, but. Our country is a big country. There are yeah. many other wonderful states too and other regions. If you were looking at whether it is one API, you know, great partnership, Purdue, yeah. right? AI partnership, open architecture with our Discovery Park District deployment, mm -hmm. doesn't have to be semiconductors. Any conversation, what would you say to somebody who says, oh, but Midwest, I don't need to go there. You know, I got some other great states already. What would you say to them? You know, when I, when I had the, the honor of being, you know, with the president and announcing the Silicon Heartland, mm -hmm. you know, if I think about the Silicon Heartland, right, you know, what is it that makes this so good for what we do? You all want to work, you want to build stuff, you want to manufacture, you want to do that well, right? And to me, that's what it takes to rebuild the manufacturing in the nation, right? Uh, and <laughs> Yeah, and to me, the, the, the response that we've gotten since we announced our mm -hmm. Ohio factory, you know, from the people, from, you know, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get the construction workers there to go build that thing. We're gonna work together to go give you the talent. You know, we're gonna solve, you know, whatever problem that you have to make that work. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, that's why the Silicon Heartland is such a powerful notion for the entire mm -hmm. you know, Midwest and one that I hope that you know, we're having this conversation you know, a decade, two decades mm -hmm. from now and we've seen this resurgence, not just in research, you know, but in manufacturing, right? And we need manufacturing science and mm -hmm. engineering at mm -hmm. scale because, you know, hey, we're just folk that want to get stuff done and that's why I love the Midwest. Yeah. You know, if Governor Holcomb were here, or Senator Young, actually this morning, at the ME Commons launch event in D.C., mm -hmm. highlighted what Indiana has been doing in the mm -hmm. past couple of years, building out this hard tech corridor yep. Yep. from Indianapolis, where Purdue University Indianapolis will open July 1 next year, our first urban mm -hmm. comprehensive campus, through Lebanon District, where Eli Lilly is mm -hmm. investing a $3 billion plus and there are other opportunities as well. And then, of course, here, West Lafayette, including 
Purdue Main Campus Discovery Park District with a vibrant ecosystem, right? 65 miles long with a hard tech, ag tech and pharmaceutical and life science manufacturing, transportation, logistics and aerospace manufacturing, semiconductor, microelectronic manufacturing, things that you can touch, right? What we make, what we grow, what we move, combined with the bytes of AI with these atoms. Now, we can keep going, but it's almost six o'clock, and I got to ask the last question, and this is a tough one. You must have many stressful days and nights leading this iconic, important company at a critical moment. So I guess it's 24 seven job, and there's a different kind of stress, it's stressful every day, but can you name one day one single moment the past two and a half years as Intel CEO that was the most stressful moment for you mm -hmm. so far? Well, there's probably two moments I like to say mm -hmm. su super quickly. Uh, one is, um, you know, I had worked super hard to get the CHIPS Act to come to the floor for vote. You know, you know Todd Young mm -hmm. and Cornyn and mm -hmm. Schumer and so on like that, a fundamental Mitch McConnell had to let it come to the vote mm -hmm. on the floor. And I, you know, I'd done everything I possibly could, you know, every senator, every house member, you know, I, you know, I, you know, other than, you know, fully prostrating myself in Mitch McConnell's office, you know, I mean, you know, <laughs> just, you know, and it was like, is he gonna let it come to the floor for vote mm -hmm. or not? Super stressful. Mm -hmm. And I remember finally, you know, praying that night, you know, mm -hmm. as I went home and says, okay, God, I could not have worked harder to get this done, mm -hmm. right? Just couldn't have worked harder. And if it comes to the floor for vote tomorrow, mm -hmm. you be praised. And if not, I don't know how this is gonna work out, but you'll still be praised. And to me, that was just such, you know, both a stressful moment, mm -hmm. you know, but also an extraordinary moment, right, in this whole journey, mm -hmm. you know, that we've been on. And guess what? It came to the floor for vote. Well, right? this we is July, play. 2021? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 2022. 22. 22. Yeah. Yes, yeah, as well. Well, your and prayer then, was answered in amen. one way. Yeah. Amen. And yeah. then, you know, in uh, our Q3 earnings call, right in 22, you know, I got to tell the street, you know, that we were missing, mm -hmm. right, our earnings guidance, not by a little bit, by a whole lot, mm -hmm. uh, that we were going to post the first corporate loss, right, for Intel in 30 years. Wow. Right, mm -hmm. and that we expect we're going to do that for multiple quarters. You know, mm -hmm. I followed that by announcements of pay cuts to every employee uh, mm -hmm. in the company. Right, you know, right, the most for me and the board mm -hmm. and everything else uh, uh, like that, mm -hmm. and basically told them that uh, you know this, you, you know, we 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 have an austerity period in mm -hmm. front of us, team. Right, mm -hmm. but don't get confused. We're still on this great mission. Yes. And it's going to be super hard as we go through, as one of the questions was talking about, you know, the supply demands, you know, cycle, you know, mm -hmm. you know, right. So I get to be the CEO, right, that gets to explain, right, on the corporate record that we had the first losses in 30 years uh, as a company. Was that stressful? <laughs> super stressful, right, uh, associated with it. But nobody belongs in the chair of the president or the chair of the CEO if you're not ready to stand up in front of your people Right, and be able to say, this is hard, this is mm -hmm. difficult. You know, I'm accountable for this. This is me, I'm cutting your salary because it's the right thing to keep the company you know, mm -hmm. successful. And I'm gonna plan on restoring it, rewarding mm -hmm. my objective, right, you know, is to execute the mission, right, to you know, get you back to where you're being paid appropriately mm -hmm. and ultimately to make you wealthy. But that's not why we're here. We are here to execute the greatest mission to turn around this iconic company, mm -hmm. to rebuild its position in the technology industry and reshore manufacturing at scale so that we can improve the lives of every person on the planet. And if that's why you're here, then you belong in that chair. If that's not why you're here, I want somebody else in that chair who is on mission with me. And those were super stressful days. Well. I noticed uh, that uh, when I go to Intel, it used to be fruit at breakfast meeting, and then there were no fruits. Um, <laughs> in fact, there were no breakfast at breakfast meeting. Um, now I know why. Yeah, uh, we still feed our people, but anyway. Uh, yeah. And um, 
Don't worry, by the way, I'm not going to say exactly that to Purdue employee in mm -hmm. uh, this physical year, at least. Uh, uh, well, what you just demonstrated, Pat, I think is exactly the kind of integrity and intelligence, and patriotism, that's why I respect you so much as a friend, and a colleague, and we are so blessed to have you as a leader of our iconic company representing American innovation in this century. Give it up to Pat Gausinger. <laughs>